Thank you for listening to the Writers Guild of Alberta podcasts. The following episode was recorded in 2020 as part of the WGA's online reading series, sponsored by the Rosé Foundation. The audio quality may differ from recording to recording. We want to thank the authors and hosts for their permission to share these audio-only episodes with you, and thank the Rosé Foundation again for their generous support. My name is Alexis Kinlan. Um, I'm a fiction writer. My new book, Mad Cow, just came out. I'm also a journalist and a poet, and I'm very pleased to um, introduce Bob Stallworthy. Um, I first met Bob when Frontenac published my first book, and Bob was working for Frontenac, and he asked me, he was the first person who ever asked me to sign a book. (laughs) It was a momentous occasion for me, and he's helped me a lot along the way. I'm going to read his biography, and then um, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement and some thank yous, and then Bob is going to read for about 16 minutes. And then I'll come back and we will do a q and I have some questions for Bob and I'm sure you do have some questions too. And you can type them in the chat on the YouTube. But right away, I'll get started with our program. So Bob Stallworthy has been active in the Alberta writing community since he began writing full-time and professionally in 1985. He is a member of the Writers' Union of Canada and the Writers' Guild of Alberta. Bob has four books of poetry previously published. His poetry has been shortlisted for the City of Calgary W.O. Mitchell Book Prize twice and the Stephen G. Stephenson Prize for Poetry once. Bob has numerous accolades. He's a member of lifetime member of the Writers Guild of Alberta and the recipient of the Golden Pen Award for Lifetime Achievement for the Writers Guild of Alberta in 2019. He has been a patient patient family advisor with the Kidney Health Strategic Clinical Network Alberta Health Services since 2016. He is full-time caregiver for his wife who suffered traumatic kidney failure in 2013. So that's a bit about Bob. And now I'd like to tell you a little bit about the land that we are on. Um, I'm on Treaty 6, but Bob is on Treaty 7. So I'll read the Treaty 7 acknowledgement. We're acknowledged... Bob is on the land, the Treaty 7 territory, the traditional territories of the Blackfoot nations, including Siksika, Pekani, Kayanai, Tsutsina, and Stony Nakoda First Nations. We also acknowledge all the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit whose footsteps have marched this land for centuries, have marked this land for centuries. Um, I'd also like to thank the Writers Guild of Alberta for these events. Um, As an author who also has a book coming out at this time, I know that these kind of events are really help you connect to the community and um, are really good for for letting us enjoy um, newly released books and new literature. And I'd also like to thank the Rosé Foundation for um, their gracious sponsorship of this series. With that, I'm going to mute myself and Bob will take us away with his reading. Thank you, Alexis. Uh, Thank you for the um, very uh, kind introduction. Uh, Thank you to everybody who has been able to uh, give us, give me some of your time this evening and join us. And um, I'd also like to thank the Writers Guild of Alberta for uh, organizing the um, the reading series that I'm and, and making me a part of it. Um, it is, as Alex says, a good way of um, a writer getting the information on um, a new book uh, or a new to most people book uh, out there. So I thank the Writers Guild as well. Um, Alec, Alexis and I sort of talked about how this would go tonight. And we both decided that um, perhaps one of the things to do to start the the reading off would be for me to read the uh, preface preface in the book. It's the first time I've ever put a preface in a book of poetry. But um, I think if I do, it will uh, give you, um, the audience, a uh, bit of an idea as to 
where and why these poems came about as they did. So what I'll do is to start out by uh, reading the preface. And then I have about seven poems, which I will read with a little bit of um, yik yak in between. And uh, then I think by that time, Alex will, Alexis will be ready to uh, come back and join us. On November 19th, 2013, Marilyn Stallworthy collapsed in the parking lot of a Calgary shopping center. Her lungs invaded by fragments of blood clots that had migrated from her leg. She would have died there, uh, but a physician and his wife were also in the parking lot and saw her go down. An EM EMS team was only five minutes away. Um, and in spite of Marilyn's heart stopping four times in the parking lot, the EMS team kept her alive and got her to the emergency room at the Med Foothills Medical Center. I was at Mount Royal University taking a literary event for which I had silenced my phone. Marilyn had dropped me off there and promised to pick me up an hour and a half later. She was late. When I opened my phone to call her, I saw that I had several calls and then the phone rang in my hand. Time was running out. Marilyn stayed in hospital for 254 days. She almost died several times there, particularly in those first hours. Her future would be confinement to a bed, ventilation, dialysis, and resolve. My, for me, it was fear, patience, loneliness, and hope. On July 31st, 2014, Marilyn came home. She was predicted to need a wheelchair most of the time and dialysis three days a week for the rest of her life. She walked out of that hospital's front door using her wheelchair as a walker. She still uses a walker or a cane. And for the past five years, she hasn't required dialysis. Now that's changed in the last year and she now um, does dialysis every night um, while she's asleep and she does it at home. The survival rate for what Marilyn has been through is about 2%. So that will give you a little bit of um, the background behind which these or yeah, behind which these these poems were um, were written and before i go any further one of the things i would like to do also is to thank richard harrison for not only being a friend and a mentor but for the excellent skills that he brought to bear as an editor on this book and um, may help me make these poems um, the best that they could be. And I guess I should also at the same time thank Frontenac House for publishing the book. Marilyn, as the, as the preface said, um, the uh, EMS got her to the Foothills Medical Center and they got her into the ER. And um, I did catch up with her there. Um, and eventually we wound up uh, going up to the ICU unit and I had to spend a, uh, an hour or more waiting while the nurses got Marilyn settled in the, in the ICU before I could get in to see her. Um, but this first poem starts with being in the ICU. The question the doctor asked me in ICU if he doesn't give you the clot busting drugs, you die for sure. If he does, you might bleed to death. You lie unconscious beside us. And because I am here, so is the question. What should he do? The answer is simple. Just fix this. 
then the answer he can use. The only one I could give, but not the only one that could have been. 254 nights later, when we get home from the hospital, I tell you, I'm glad you're back. You say, so am I. Then, thank you, as if you heard. Um, Marilyn obviously was in the hospital over Christmas. And Christmas is one of the uh, biggest times of the year, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I'm still uh, the biggest kid on the block when it comes to Christmas. And I can thank my mother for that. Um, but I can also thank my wife when she discovered how much Christmas meant to me uh, after we got married. She um, put a lot of time and effort into making Christmas important in our house. Christmas. The hospital phones, 2 a.m., tells me I need to be there. The doctor on call tells me they are doing everything they know how to do. I show them, I still have tears I haven't used. Tell the doctor, you are all I have left. One of the things that, that happened um, every couple of days while Marilyn was in the hospital was that she would go down and be taken down to the dialysis unit. And every time they took her down there, her blood pressure would crash. And it didn't take very long before the dialysis unit was pushing hard to move Marilyn back to the ICU unit um, when her blood pressure crashed. And us within sight of the harbor. They repeat over the intercom, code 66, dialysis unit, second floor, code 66. Someone's having trouble breathing, dialysis unit, second floor. That's where you are. They want to send you back to the ventilator in ICU. You've already said you won't go. I have, for most of my life, thought of myself as being a religious. Um, however, for also most of my life, I have worn a little silver cross around my neck. And um, one day when I was talking to Richard about poems to put in the, in the book, he asked me about the cross and he said, why do you wear it? And I said, well, I don't know. I just do. I, I don't know why I wear it. And he thought about that for a minute and he said, uh, yeah, you do. And I want you to go away and write about it. And I wasn't sure what I was going to try to say. And then this poem and several others finally emerged. The Beggar. So long I've told myself I don't believe. Don't pray. Don't ask. Don't even pretend. I'm the same as all the others who don't believe until there is no one else. I'm begging out loud. To whom? My neighbors? Their homes turned dark hours ago. They cannot hear. Their doors are locked. The rooms in our house, foreign places, full of shadows of things no longer known. I turn on every light in the house, as if doing so I will find you, not your absence standing there. For tonight, if there is someone to listen, someone who cares, and God knows I need someone to care, I will beg. I will believe.
It took about um, two months, two and a half months, maybe. So somewhere into uh, late January, early February of 2014, before we knew that Marilyn was actually going to survive. And even when we did know that, uh, we didn't know quite what it was going to look like. And even though those things were positive, and I, I was uh, feeling much more positive about the situation, I also found myself getting angry at times, especially when I was by myself. Impact statement. At night, between lights off and dreams, I could tell you I wanted back the way it was. When you had calendar squares filled, words, numbers, arrows, reminders to both of us of our past and future. When we would decide in 20 minutes to drive 200 kilometers just for the hell of it. When I was so sure I wouldn't have to fill all of the air in our house, the flatness in our bed by myself. I want it back, all of it. I could tell you how robbed I feel. Thank God you have already fallen asleep. Um, as I said, Marilyn did get home uh, July 31st, 2014. And she um, was on dialysis for a little while, but um, had enough energy that she really wanted to start doing things around the house like she used to do. And um, one of the things that she didn't used to do was garden. She didn't like being outside and gardening. That was my job. But when she came home from the hospital, um, one of the things she decided was that she wanted to go outside and do some gardening. Something more that you can do. Today you asked me if you could help. Said you could water the flowers by the front door. You stood holding that hose, watered lily of the valley, the cedar tree, peony, and hosta. Your face, the most beautiful flower breaking into bloom. Um, the last six years, I guess it is now, from July of 2014. In fact, it's almost six years to the day um, as of tonight. Um, have been quite a roller coaster. And um, not all of the the time has been really pleasant, but it has certainly taught both of us a whole bunch of lessons. And in particular, it has taught me um, a pretty important lesson for my life. This garden. The rose bush I bought the day you came home from the hospital blooms again for the fourth year. Last night, I combed leftover summer from the wildflower bed I, play, I made to mark one year home. I planted sweet peas, hoping they would climb their colors, their stories into colors we use to celebrate. This garden teaches me, relearn to love. Thank you. I guess I'm looking for Alexis to uh, come back and join us again. I'm back and thank you for your um, beautiful reading, Bob. Um, before I get into some of the questions I had, I realized that there was one question that I wanted to ask based on your reading. I'm just wondering how long you and Marilyn have been together. We will have been married um, 44 years as of the 7th of August. 
Oh, wow. Um, happy early anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit on the phone, you and I did a pre-chat. And so I'm what I think it would be interesting for the audience to know, and I'd like to hear more about, is the process of writing this book and the role of your writing group in writing this book. OK, well, I think that's an important thing to, to sort of know as well, because um, there was a point in the um, in the whole thing with Marilyn, I think it was probably um, Christmas Eve um, morning, Christmas Eve morning. I got called back to the hospital at two o'clock in the morning and um, things were not good. And I remember walking down the corridor um, all by myself, lots of green light around. Um, and I got to a corner and as I turned the corner, I said out loud, I don't give a shit if I never write another word. And I tell that story because as we got to know Marilyn was going to get better and would eventually be coming home, she started to push me back towards the writing group, which I had, had not attended. And um, when I went back, Richard and the rest of the group, of course, but Richard uh, welcomed me back with saying, I'm glad you're back. I wanted you here. I don't mind if you don't write anything, just be here. Mm -hmm. And for the first uh, couple of weeks, I don't know, I, I've lost track of how many, um, I didn't write anything. I just listened. And eventually I started, the group always starts with a five to 10 minute free write. And I put the pen on the page and things started to happen. Words started to show up. Um, and um, I got brave enough to read some of them to the group. And Richard's reaction was, that's getting close to a poem. And um, he said, don't throw it away. Don't lose it. So um, after I had been doing that for several months, um, you know, the the writing journal was beginning to fill up with these don't throw them away things. Mm -hmm. And I had to start to think about what to do with them now that I had them. And then we started to really talk about whether or not this was going to turn into a book. Which is, as you know, it's not the same thing as just writing a bunch of poems. No, it's really not. It's just you sometimes then you just start being able to see the book and you're like, oh, I guess this is a book now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Um, so we, when you and I were, so, oh, just one, one second. Um, so we have one comment from someone who thanked you for the lovely reading. They really enjoyed the reading. Um, yeah. Anyone else, if you wanna uh, write a comment or ask a question in the chat, please feel free. Um, so Bob, when you and I talked about this on, on the phone, um, you were telling me that this book for you, and I agreed with you and saw it instantly, is a book of love poems and a book about transitions. And I'm just yep. wondering if you can elaborate some more on that. Okay, I think both of those things, I agree, you know, I, I know we talked about them. Um, and I, I do believe that the book is both a look, uh, book of love poems and um, a book of transitions, but it didn't. I didn't set out set out to write either. Um, I set out to just write a bunch of poems, um, and it wasn't until I had finished the book um, that I went back through them with Richard on several occasions, of course, but also on my own, and suddenly thought. I know the word love only shows up once in the book, but I think part of the reason that I wrote the poems that I did was because of love. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I so told you on the phone, I would, I would love to torment a grade 12 class, uh, high school class, with the comment that the book is a book of love poems and watch them argue with me because the only word, the only time love shows up in the book is in that last poem. 
Um, but um, that started to give me the idea that, yeah, all of these poems are coming from some place which is not just observation of what happened. Well, just um, like re reading the book on the first time, and then of course it's always different when you get to hear a poet read their own work, especially something as so personal as this book with the added stories in it. Um, the tenderness and the the fear in the poems is very apparent to me, and that really comes across as and and makes it more of a a, a book about love. Yeah. Um, and and one of the things that that I I, I always thought that I was. Oh, not hard or tough, but that I could cope with a lot of things uh, until this happened with Marilyn. Mm -hmm. And I've never been so absolutely terrified in all my life. Yeah. Nor did I, nor did I know totally what it was I was terrified of. Mm -hmm. I was just terrified. I was scared, witless. And um, there were times when Somebody would just look at me sideways and I would burst into tears. And there mm -hmm. were other times when that didn't happen, of course. But um, I just didn't know how I was going to survive if she didn't. Yeah. And the, the, um, the, the transition thing came from a request. Uh, I belong to a provincial committee um, through Alberta Health. Um, on kidney health mm -hmm. and uh, the manager of the committee had said to me that at one point he was familiar with some of the poems and he said we want you to do a presentation at one of our committee meetings on transitions in your experience from healthcare." and he, he said they can be big transitions or small ones whatever and I looked at the book and I suddenly thought yeah um sure there are transitions of you know from life the way i i knew it to suddenly having to face this whole crisis in the hospital uh there were transitions from um uh, er to icu and from icu to a medical unit all of those kinds of things which i looked at and saw as being big transitions. But then there were also the small ones, some of which are in the poems in the book. Transitions within me, transitions mm -hmm. within Meryl, transi transitions within our relationship. Because the relationship is not the same one we had on November the 18th, mm -hmm. 2013. Not yeah. by a long shot. So, um... One thing I was reminded of or kind of felt as I read the book is um, the brevity of the poems. And so I'm just wondering if, um, if, if you can comment on that, because what it kind of reminded me a bit of was William Carlos Williams, just the, like the, and this is kind of the stuff I dig, like the plain language, the like, you know, the shortness, these are all things that I, I really like. So I just wonder if you could comment on, on on that kind of the style of the poems. Well, I'm I'm flattered that you that you uh, are reminded of William Carlos Williams with with some of the things that I do. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the shortness and a lot of the shortest poems came out of the editing. Um, and Richard, of course, had as my editor had considerable influence on that, but. Um, one of the one of the things that he has always um, asked us when we were looking at poems was um, when you get to the end of the poem, is there anything left to say? Is there a question left unanswered? Um, is some is your reader wandering off into the into the ether to make up the grocery list or you know have you have you suddenly left them completely behind somehow and if the answer to all of those questions is no then why are you saying anything more you've said it 
let the, let the poem say it. And yeah. so when, when you, you know, with that first poem in the book, which is, uh, I didn't read it tonight, but the one lines, um, I think it's tonight, um, I follow the lines on the page. Um, tonight I follow the lines on the page. As I write them, they lead me here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do I need need to say anything else? No, like I, I actually was just re-looking at the book before we got started talking. And I was just like, when you're looking at it and you, you know the preface and you know what the book is about, it's just kind of like the poem lines is like, okay, we're starting this journey now. Yep. Like this is the journey. We're we're on it. We're we're on the train. And so then and it, you're going through the on the train through this experience that you and Marilyn had together. Yeah. Yeah. So and it could be the lines of the of the actual poem, or it could be the blank lines on a page in the journal. Either mm -hmm. one or both. And in my mind it was both. It was, you know, there's the there's the blank page with the lines on it. And my pen is resting on the left hand margin. And as I write, I follow what I'm writing. But where do the lines lead? They lead me into the book. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that like also just uh, for me too, is like the, the blankness, the shortness of the poems, the like as if you were writing them near bedside or in short moments when when a person is really grieving or anxious about someone else's health sometimes they have trouble concentrating for long periods of time so i think like the brevity of the poems actually led to that like led me to that feeling too like it kind of summed up that anxious i don't have time i can't concentrate feeling so yeah um i'm gonna read a couple com we do have a couple comments um okay. that come in so uh Peter Midgley says, lovely reading. Thanks, Bob. I and uh, Betty Jane Hagerett said in, Bob, no matter how many times I read these poems and hear your reading, it's like encountering them anew and they will never cease to move me deeply. Thank you, Betty. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. So you were saying a little bit about the the Kidney Network asked you to do a presentation. So I'm wondering if like this if you've um, brought this book to the Kidney Network or if they know about it, if there's some kind of tie-in between what you're doing with them and your your poetry work. They know about it and, and a number of the uh, people who are sort of the managers of the, it's a huge committee. It, mm -hmm. It's a provincial committee and it, it uh, covers from, you know, Grand Prairie and Cold Lake, um, Fort Mac, all the way down to Lethbridge and Medicine Hat. Um, and they know about it. The manager of the um, area, the Calgary area, uh, has been become quite a good friend of mine. Um, and um, he certainly has promoted my, my stuff uh, within the committee. But so do some of the other, some of the other directors uh, were all, and some of them were actually um, at the launch. Mm -hmm. uh, where it will go, I don't know. Uh, it's totally up to them. Uh, if they want to try to make some some more out of it for their own needs, great. I'm I'm, I'm there with with bells on. But um, if it is fine the way it is, then I'm okay with that too. I don't think that there, there isn't a, um, at the moment, there isn't a, um, a connection over and above the connection between the few people that were at the launch and, and the few people that I've sort of become friends with. Yeah. And so I wanted to ask you about the title poem. So why did you decide to title, like, why did Impact Statement become the title poem? And, and it, was a, it was a poem, I guess. It was a poem that didn't have a title when, mm -hmm. I, when I first wrote it. And I was at a reading with, with actually two people, Richard Harrison and Richard Stevenson. Um, Richard Stevenson is also a, a Guild member. Um, 
And we were talking afterwards, and Richard Harrison said to me, I think I have a title for that poem. Um, and he said, impact statement. And I thought about it rather quickly, because he was just standing in the hallway. And it suddenly occurred to me, that might well be a title for the book. And I, I had to live with it. I wasn't I wasn't absolutely convinced, but the more I read the poem and the more I thought about it, the more I thought, yeah, that's this whole um, eight and a half months plus, the, you know, the original eight and a half months had a huge impact on me. And what I'm talking about in the poem um, is that impact. And I think that, you know, sometimes Marilyn will say, well, the book is about me. And I have to say, yes, it is. Um, but really, it's about me and my reaction to what happened to you. Mm -hmm. um, you were the main, you were the one that it happened to. Some of it, you know, some of it you don't remember. And I'm not going to tell you uh, <laughs> unless you ask specifically uh and i have done that uh, but there are things that that she doesn't remember and i'm not about to tell her yeah uh, and, and, until or unless she asks um but the, the the thing the the poems in the book even even you know the last one talking about the garden the the flower beds um that's she was the reason for the for the roses being here in the first place, but it's the roses and the sweet peas and all of that that uh, the flower beds in the first place that were my reaction to what had happened to her. Mm -hmm. And I so I think once I I know there was a couple of people who who said oh but impact statement is is such a common phrase now everybody's using it and I think, yeah but that to me is immaterial i'm using it and i'm using it uh for what it means to me so one thing i've wondered about bob um and i'm just curious if you can um you know as this is your your fifth book right i think i said yes. Yeah, so good book. So I'm just wondering, like, from writing this book and from writing the other books, how writing and reading poetry help you make sense of the world? Wow, wow. I know. Um, we didn't talk about this question. I'm springing this on him. Yeah, they, no, <laughs> no fair. Um, <laughs> it does help me make sense of the world. And I think that, that, um, that's one of the reasons that you write and I write and anybody we know that, that writes does it. it. To try to figure out what do I feel and what do I think? And if we're really lucky, what do I do about it? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that I, poetry pick, didn't, didn't pick me, I picked poetry. And, I also decided I would become a writer rather than having this um, idea that at, at age three, I was going to be, uh, I was writing my first novel and, and I was going to be a writer for the rest of my life. Um, and I think that when I did that, um, I moved into um, a feeling that this was this was mine. This was me. This was if I ate and if I didn't, too bad. Just you know, one more dead carcass on the road. Um, but I wasn't trying to measure up to what my parents thought I should be, or what my um, friends thought I should be. Most people didn't know what I was doing. Um, and when I said I was a writer, the, oh, really? <laughs> half, you know, half, half of them, 
half of them, they walked away after that. Um, and the other half sort of looked at me like I suddenly sprouted two heads. But anyway, um, it became mine. It became the way I deal with the world all the time. And, and I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you feel that like, um, since you've talked about the process of writing this book, do you feel like just looking back at this book kind of help, helped you like as a record of your experiences or did it help you understand the deeper implications of what were, was happening or, All you know, of those things, I think, yeah, all of those things. I think, you know, um, some people think that it, it, it should have been a cathartic experience. And to a certain extent, it was mm -hmm. uh, and is. But I also find that um, with this particular book, when I when I look at it, I still get some of the anxiety that was there when the things were happening. Yeah. And I presume that that will eventually lessen. Um, the further we get away from from it, but I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just have to see. Uh, yeah. So, uh, it's a very, ahead. it's a very open and vulnerable book. So I can understand why you would feel some of the anxiety and stuff because it's. But I think that what like the vulnerability in the book is what makes it beautiful and is what will make readers connect with it. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so when did you exactly, like, you, did you start the book immediately or you said you started it when Marilyn was, um, was already, was already home. So did you, did you have any journal or anything or you just started in the writing group, just kind of free writing and it came from there? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it really did grow out of the free writing, um, when I, when I, first went back to the group and started to to um, put anything on the page. I didn't really think that I was going to get a book out of that. In fact, I've said to some people, uh, I'm the most surprised person in the, on the planet that there yeah. is a book. Uh, because I, I really didn't think there would be. I didn't I guess I didn't trust myself enough with the emotions mm -hmm. um, that I would be able to find the words that I wanted. Um, I knew that I wanted to write something that that I could read without bursting into tears every time I looked at it. Yeah. Um, but I didn't know whether I could could do that whether I could read them out loud to anybody. It was, it was a very, very gradual um, metamorphosis, I guess, uh, to the point where, you know, the, group, the writers group, Richard and, and I sort of came to the same conclusion that, gee, you know, you've got, 15 or 20 of these things, uh, what do you think? Maybe, maybe, maybe what you're doing is working on the book. But like, and you know this as well as anybody, you've got to be really careful about, oh, I'm working on a book. Because that puts you in a very different position from... Yeah, I think it's uh, just started happening to me, actually. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it puts you... In, in a very different position from, oh, I'm writing a bunch of poems, or I'm just writing a poem, or I'm just writing a, a scene that might go somewhere someday uh, in a novel, but not right now. As soon mm -hmm. as you said, that's a book, your mind starts to think in those terms. Well, for me, I always describe it, I've started describing it to people as a haunting, which mm -hmm. is not kind of gothic but it just it becomes it's there and I think about it and I think about it and it's like I need to write about it and get it out otherwise it's just there and I'm like yeah. okay this is this needs to come out now I guess this is what I'm going to be working on yep. yeah yeah anyway yeah. Bob I could talk to you all night but unfortunately um we run out of time we run out of time we managed to, we managed to keep on talking um but I would just want to thank everyone for coming tonight and 
I want to thank the Writers Guild of Alberta for letting me host. And um, it was just a pleasure to get to, um, to, to get to sit with this book and get to talk to Bob about this incredibly moving book. Um, have to admit that even though I was muted in the chat, I was uh, trying not to tear up a few times. So it's a good thing I was off camera. <laughs> so. Well, thank you very much, Alexis, for, for uh, hosting this tonight. Um, I really appreciate it. I'm glad to get the chance to talk to you. And again, thank you to the Writers Guild um, for creating this reading series. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, have the re enjoy the yes. rest of your evening. I hope it's lovely where you are, and have a good night. Thanks to everybody who was here.